Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Cantina Hangouts. I'm your host, Diego Crespo. With me today is my co-host, Universa. Hey, how's it going? You uh, woke me up right now, just getting out of bed. <laughs> yeah, it, it's freezing. Sometimes when we record the other shows and we upload them in the morning, we pretend we're waking up early. We're actually waking up like this time. Yeah, so I, but it's okay because we're also joined by a special guest who we also woke up early, Andrew Boyd <laughs> Allen. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Hello, everyone. Uh, you might know me from, you know, Twitter, where, you know, I, I yell at Diego a lot. Uh, <laughs> my name is Andrew Allen. Um, I go by they, them pronouns. I don't know if that's helpful, but th- there you go. Uh, I like Star Wars, and that's why I'm here. Yeah, you, you have uh, a great Twitter history with Star Wars. Oh, boy, because- don't I. Your takes are always inflammatory or, or at least very exciting. I don't know why they're inflammatory. I see worse takes like from people who clearly don't have brains and you have a brain, <laughs> you know? Like even when we disagree, it's like, I totally see where you're coming from at least. And you have like a valid point about right. like your, your, your own feelings, you know? For sure. Well, I mean, like, I think part of it is that just contrary to what other some other people might think I'm genuinely not being contrarian. Like I, I, I don't, I don't say things just to be inflammatory or hostile. Like I do genuinely think everything that I say, and it is coming from like a specific sort of, I don't know, rhetoric involving like what I consider to be good filmmaking, what I consider to be good storytelling, what I consider to be good star Wars and just good, like sort of franchising in general. It's like, I can always explain why I feel the way I feel. Um, but I, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think that, I also just, I think I'm very open to rediscovering things about movies is a big part of it. Like there was a period where like, you know, I'm a huge prequels fan and you know this, but like there was a period where I kind of drifted away from those movies, like after like childhood or whatever. Like the only exposure I had to them after the age of like 12 for a number of years was just like little, like just in YouTube clips or just something people would highlight, you know, the, the sand moment or just like little gawky things. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess those are bad, you know? And then I revisited all, like before Force Awakens came out, I revisited the six original films with some friends who had never seen it before. And we were watching them. And I was like, you know what? When I'm watching these, like taken on the whole, I'm actually responding to these much the same way I did when I was a kid. Um, and so I think part of it was just like, I don't know. Like I, I'm, I'm open to sort of like, feeling one way about something and then being open again to discover it a new way and just sort of, you know, whatever, wherever the winds, the winds take me. And, you know, I feel differently about movies each time and like, I'm okay with that. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe years down the line, I'll come, come around to rise of Skywalker. I mean, who knows, like anything's possible, but like, I, I think that I just don't feel any, any need to like overly commit to a standpoint that I had when I was like six or something. I think that's part of like why my opinions seem contrary, <laughs> contrarian. So I'm like, you know what, whatever. New Hope's not that good, whatever. Like, you know, <laughs> I can say that, you know, and it's, it's, it's whatever, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's what I, I love talking to you about too. Like you're, because you try to keep an open mind, like as often as possible, everyone has their biases and blind spots. Cause we're, we're just, we're just human beings. That's going to happen. But Definitely. like, you know, you're, you're willing to like evolve. As a yeah, human being, it's which, fun. Uh, it's fun feeling fun. differently about things. You know, it's fun just being like, I hated that. And like, now I like it or like kind of vice versa. It's kind of just fun, like being subjective, like accepting that art is subjective. It's not about like gunning for like the definitive answer about whether something's good. It's just about like experiencing it, whatever the way you feel about it at different points in your life. Yeah. And that's a great way to segue into the episode we're here to talk about today, The Mandalorian, the Chapter 14, The Tragedy, directed by my boy, Robert Rodriguez, uh, because there's a, there's a thing that happened in this episode that I did not expect to be excited about, because yeah. I have never cared about, spoilers, Boba Fett, ever. <laughs> and I, I wasn't, I wasn't I super won over. I wasn't like, oh, fuck, yeah, I love Boba Fett now. I was just like, yeah, it's kind of cool, because mm-hmm. he's never been a character before. We could pretend he has, but really he hasn't. And that, <laughs> yeah, but that, that's okay, you know? Like, yeah, that's yeah. all right. I, I, I liked it. It was fun. It was cool. Uh, so, Andrew, really quick, since you're the guest here, where are you coming from with The Mandalorian, and what did you think about this episode? Um, so with The Mandalorian, I've had, I've had I don't want I, a kind of a shaky relationship with The Mandalorian. Like, 
historically like the first season didn't click for me more it, like didn't click for me as much as it should have i think um because it didn't feel like enough of a show yet like the events of the finale felt like they should have been the events of a pilot you know where you, mm-hmm. you establish your main villain you give the main character a very specific goal um and the first season just felt like it was kind of meandering a bit um but i like the last stretch of it like the last three episodes are really good um and then the second season has just generally been a massive improvement on the whole like i think just having that finale sort of set up the rest of the show it just feels a bit more motivated like giving them you know find the jedi and you know being chased by moff gideon and also just going deeper into the world it's not necessarily like a lot of this is clone wars and rebels overlap but like just going feeling like i'm i'm the main character is delving into the sort of the bowels of the star wars universe in a way that it kind of felt like he was flirting around the exterior of it in the first season um so second season on the whole has been much better and has been pretty pretty damn good star wars on the whole i would argue yeah yeah i think yeah i think that was the general like takeaway we had like from the whole season of podcasting summed it up pretty well um yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, it's, it's weird. Like, I can't even think of the Mandalorian's, like, motivation, like, in the first couple episodes. It, it's very vague. Yeah, it's just wandering and, like, he has the baby Yoda, but then just kind of, I don't know, yeah. like, the, the plot disappears. <laughs> it does. It does yeah. kind of. And, like, I'm okay with, like, I, I, I do definitely agree that the show, with the showrunner's decisions, that the show needs to be largely built of like standalone sort of adventures, you know, in the vein of like you know, old adventure serials or Samurai Jack to give a more recent sort of example, something like that. But like you need in Samurai Jack, like the characters drift, like he knows he needs to get back to the past to mm-hmm. save his father and defeat a coup, right? Like that's, that's the, the premise. And you need that foundation in order for those like side episodes to still feel motivated yeah you know Mm -hmm. um and the first season was lacking in that respect for me yeah no i would agree and diego Diego should know this because i finally watched samurai jack forced him yeah well i i saw the first four seasons of samurai jack i finally saw the last season this year and it's really good is it Uh, i i I need to watch it oh yeah no like not not to get not to get too into that, but like I was concerned because they were like, "Oh, it's like on Adult Swim now," and I'm like, <laughs> I, "Like I hate that." Like, "Oh, it's, it's for adults now," and it's like right. it never well, is. Well, but no, I, it was it was like really good. So I, I would think like being on Adult Swim would be more irrelevant, be more like stoner humor. Yeah, I, I just thought it was gonna here. be like stupid and like, "Oh, look how violent we can be now," and it's yeah. like, no, it's still like beautifully designed, and choreographed, yeah. and oh, it's, yeah. it's impressive, but. uh yeah, yeah Matt Mandalorian overall big big improvement. Big, big improvement, big improvement. That said, <laughs> I didn't I I just want to make some disclaimers because here's here's one thing. Part of this, I do feel the show is ultimately going to work best as kind of like a binge watching model. Mm-hmm. Like I think that the episodes are are kind of intentionally slight so that they read kind of like more just like there's kind of things you can blow through really easily, right? And they kind of relate to each other in a way that they're, they're, sometimes it's a one-two punch of like, this episode is the the off, ep- like sort of casual episode. This one's more intense. Just the way, it, the way it's structured, it feels a bit more like the season is the entity mm-hmm. and less so the episodes are the entities, which is funny because I said, you know, I, they are kind of one-offs in a lot of cases, but like it isn't, the episodes themselves aren't always wholly satisfying as their own thing. And I do think ultimately that's going to be best, you know, served by viewing it in, in a more holistic sense. So that's part of, that plays into what I'm about to say. I didn't feel that this was one of the strongest episodes of the season, for me personally. Um, and there's two reasons, two reasons for that. Um, one is purely a technical thing. They were shooting primarily on location, which was interesting. But it was kind of funny because I felt like it didn't have the same kind of atmosphere that they were able to generate when they were shooting in the volume in previous episodes. You know, the, the stagecraft thing that they have, which yeah. is called the volume. They are able to create these environments that had this incredible just atmosphere and vibe, especially in the, I think it's the, the, the third episode. 
Um, and last week's episode, those two in particular, Bryce Dallas Howard's and Filoni's two e- efforts this, this season had just, just this sense about them that I was like, ooh, like so atmospheric. Whereas this, it kind of felt, depending, not always. There's certain shots where I was like, this looks great. And there are other shots where I was like, this feels a little YouTube fan filmy. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like it was just, it, they didn't have enough control over their environment. So it just kind of felt like somewhere in California and it was like really brightly lit and just like, I don't know, it wasn't, it didn't all work for me visually. Um, although some of the actual action was good. Like just the, the punch of it was super satisfying. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing was just a scripting thing. I don't think on a script level, this was enough to be like a whole episode necessarily. I, I don't know. Like it was all action. Like there's nothing mm-hmm. else happening in it. It was just wall to wall set piece. Um, and it was also kind of transitional. Like sort of like you're doing yeah. this episode to get to whatever they're doing in the finale and there wasn't anything else happening. So those made it feel a little, a little slight and just a little like not the show at its best, although it had its virtues. And I think that was largely credited to Rodriguez and just his sort of punchiness as a director. But um, yeah, it had good things, but those were my drawbacks this week. Yeah, I, I, I'd actually agree. I think... Yeah this episode and the episode when they go back to the planet yeah. from the first season that no one cares about no one likes um, navarro i'm sorry like i don't care about navarro it is called navarro i don't care about navarro like i i don't <laughs> like it's it's a lava planet i guess like that's its one it just visually it doesn't interest me that much and also we've been there so much like the first season i, I really was not expecting to spend as much time in navarro as we did in the first season like by the end of the first season, I was like, we just need, need to not be on this planet anymore. And then we go back to it again so soon in season two. I was just like, I don't, it has not been long enough. Like, yeah, I, no. it really has not been. No, but um, I, I like the action in this. I am very disappointed that Rodriguez didn't get to play with as much of the tech. Right. Because he's, he's like a <laughs> tech dude. He made yeah. Alita that, look like the most Alita. expensive movie ever made. Right. You know? he's, he's like been like the wall to wall green screen director <laughs> of like the 21st century. And then he's the one who doesn't get to play with the new green screen tech like at all. That's, uh, yeah, that was, that was mean. Whoever. It, it was, was just like, weird. <laughs> it yeah. was just weird. I, I wonder, uh, does anyone think that, uh, like just circumstances just didn't let him uh work with the volume or that's it just happened that way i think the volume's really easy to work with like they have it there you know it's pretty ready and easy to use i don't know what dictated that for them it might have just been a choice just to mix things up i mean who knows it might have been his call might not have been his call but like it it was definitely i don't know it was a choice yeah it definitely was well it's interesting yeah to just like ha- um just talk about that because always enjoy your uh takes on like cgi versus practical andrew Ooh, thank you so, oh i love talking about visual effects and stuff so yeah so it's cool yeah no it's cool to talk about the volume because that's like the coolest thing it is so <laughs> cool it is so cool and there was a b actually the the stuff that looked really good i felt was the stuff at the top of the temple like mm-hmm. that environment looks great. It was when you kind of go down the hill that it started to look weirder. <laughs> but the top of the temple, I was like, when you first get there, I was like, is this the volume? Is this not? Like, because there's a lot of wind that was pretty cool mm-hmm. and convincing, but that could have been something it did in the volume. So like that environment was actually the perfect, it was so funny because that was like the first thing you see on the planet was them landing there and sort of walking up <laughs> on the thing. I was like, is this the, this is either location shooting that looks really good or it's the, vo- the best the volume has ever looked. And then they go down the hill and I was like, okay, so this is definitely location. Yeah. and uh it's not necessarily speaking to me as much but you know i i think that this season they've been doing incredible work with the volume and i think that yeah. if anything this episode kind of proves just how essential the volume is <laughs> to the look and vibe of the show yeah yeah there, there's a certain cheapness to uh the the action choreography is very good mm-hmm. like when they're taking on all the stormtroopers it's like exciting in a visceral way that i don't like, I don't care about stormtroopers anymore. Well, yeah. we've had stormtroopers, but like, it was a fun action beat. And like, it, it, it was like primarily the back half of the episode, which is like, oh yeah, th- this kind of is all this episode is. And he loses baby Yoda, which is like an actual sad thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I was like, hey, I, ca- I care. Like, you know, the running gag for me was like, I want to kill baby Yoda for the first season. And now I'm like, I like this show to the level where I'm like, no, 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 I, that's... The bit's over. I, yeah. It's just a cute character. 
Yeah. I care about it now. And I think it, it also helps. Took him away. Right. I think it also helps that he's clearly more sentient than we thought he was in the first, if that makes sense. Like he clearly yeah. has more thoughts than I think he was reading as in the first season. Like he has feelings about stuff. And I think that they made that a bit clearer over the course of the season. So it's easier to be invested in him as a character than just as like a cute sort of plush toy that happens to be wandering around the shop yeah (laughs) yeah it's just uh first season just so obvious like the merchandising and then it's also just like just seems like just a baby in that first season just a baby like it's like you you, you can't get a lot of mileage out of that but here i will say my favorite scene in this episode is not any of the action it's not boba fett or even the return of ming na wen they were smart enough to keep her alive because you don't waste Mulan like that. Um, Moff Gideon is interrogating baby Yoda and having a full-on conversation with him. Yeah. That is, and I mean this in the most positive, absolutely, like, like from the, a place of pure adoration. That is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. <laughs> it's so awesome. It's so nerdy to, to watch, like, thespian Giancarlo right. Esposito just like menacingly threaten this non-sentient this creature. Puppet. Yeah, this <laughs> puppet. This, this, this little like puppet. ball of rubber. <laughs> and it's like a good scene. <laughs> like, yeah. It brought me a little back to the to the beats with um Werner Herzog in the first season or it's oh. like it is it is dumb, but it's like dumb in exactly the way that you kind of want this show to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so ridiculous and it's so cool <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I was kind of geeking out over that and i was like no more action just this i'd watch an entire episode with them like in a dark night heat style like yeah <laughs> conversation you right <laughs> so to, you brought up you brought up uh ming na wen as fennec shand and obviously boba fett in this episode and it was it, you know it's interesting i am kind of curious the role they're meant to play going forward and like what that's going to look like. I'll, I'll, I, I, I love, you know, Ming-Na One's great. I'm waiting for the character to be something mm-hmm. like specific. Cause at the moment she's like a totally stock bounty hunter character. And there's definitely space for them to fill that in. But like, I'm waiting for them to, to do that. And so like her coming back, I was kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Whatever. Okay, fine. Whatever. She's just another one, another person who's just hard as metal and kills people in this universe. Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And Boba was cool. Boba is cool having back only, be- and I'm with you in the, in that sense, Diego. Of like, who cares about Boba Fett? Like, it's impossible to. I'm sorry. Like, everything <laughs> up to this point that has made people invested in Boba Fett has been like extra textual. Like in the Clone Wars, he's annoying, um, and then in the movies, he's just not. He's not yeah. a real thing. Like, I'm sorry, he's just not. Um, but having him come back and be. And this is true of his characterization, but having Morrison be the one to deliver the lines and everything, it's just he, just him being this kind of survivalist, mm-hmm. just this sort of like very blunt and like just very brutal kind of like survivalist character it makes him scrappy too, makes him interesting to me. Um, and just Morrison's delivery is so good. He just has this presence in this episode that I was like, ah, oh, ah, shit. This is this is great, and the fact that he's only he of course he was in both Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, but in Revenge of the Sith he was playing the clones, and he he this is his first actual time in in the Mandalorian in general, specifically playing Boba Fett physically, mm-hmm. you know, like he voiced he did the voice at, like when they redid original trilogy stuff, but it's kind of cool that despite you know being in the much maligned the probably the most maligned prequel and everything when he shows up you're like yeah that's like boba fett like it would be insane to have anybody other than him be boba fett like he feels completely right as the character and it, you're like wait is boba fett cool like like for the first time i was like is he kind of rad and i will you know what one thing that was kind of funny he became a little less cool in the episode once he put on the armor like it wasn't as cool to me as like him with the cloak and the staff and everything i was like this version of boba fett is way cooler than boba fett with the armor yeah um he just had this just this lone wanderer just energy i was like damn like the power of this presence, this delivery. He's just really cool. And I, I was I was surprised how much I missed him and his voice in the series. Cause he's just, every time he's on screen, he's just so cool. And I don't think I've been giving him his due in Attack of the Clones enough as I should have, because he was really cool in Attack of the Clones too, as Django. Like just everything, he just exudes 
just this dude who will just fucking destroy you uh and just not think twice about it and i just and he does that in this episode he's scary in this episode he's really cool so hats off to him because he's just he's so he's so rad yeah t- tomorrow morrison rules uh also he is a lighthouse keeper father in aquaman yeah. Yeah. which is an okay. incredible film with mary yeah. poppins as a kaiju but no he, he rules <laughs> and uh yeah love love to Django Fett Django Fett was a character Boba Django Fett, Fett was an actual now. character Django right. Fett in the movies I, I know that this has become more popular over the years but I've been saying this since before it was cool for the record Django Fett in the movies like purely in the movies alone infinitely cooler than Boba Fett in the movies like there's no <laughs> there's no comparison there Django's yeah. Django's dope in the movies <laughs> Boba doesn't do anything but now it's evening out of it yeah well I, I'm uh, I was it because Diego's always making fun of me because of Boba Fett, um, but I, I don't know. Like uh, I was like joking, I'm like a toxic Boba Fett fan. Where I just uh, I like him, but then at the same time, I'm like, oh yeah, he doesn't really do anything. Like he like you know just looks around or like just tracks the Falcon. He doesn't. Yeah, he's just not really. People like, like him because of merchandising stuff. Like it's all the stuff yeah. around Boba Fett that made Boba Fett popular. It's not Boba Fett. He doesn't do anything in the movie. It's just sort of like he he they released a ton of cool toys. He showed up in video games and shit. But like as a character in the films, he's a whiny kid and then he does nothing and then he gets thrown into a large space anus. It's like I <laughs> I don't know what to do. Accidentally, no less. So like yeah. well, no, um, that, yeah. that's my favorite Boba Fett moment from the uh, until now <laughs> is when Han Solo accidentally defeats him like to me that's a great comedy beat and a total Han Solo moment yeah. you know like it is I was I was I was looking at the the staff Han hits him with and I was thinking like is that the same staff he's like carrying in this episode but it wasn't is it not yeah like I looked at, okay. I went back to return and then it's like no oh, but that'd okay. be such a like a reddit post like fan art thing <laughs> right right which the show has flirted yeah. with more than it ought to yeah. uh you know we don't need like a, <laughs> and you know i've said this before and i, I don't I, I understand the impulse like their star wars you know the fans are very loud it's kind of hard to ignore them it's, cool. it's kind of hard to stay you know you want to make people happy like I, I feel i really feel for the people trying to make star wars at the moment because like it's like kind of a lose-lose yeah. situation um but they do flirt with that kind of thing a bit too much in the show and in just in Star Wars in general, like for the yeah. since Disney acquisition. Yeah. But, um, and, and you felt a little bit of that in this episode, just in terms yeah. of like, you know, it's Boba Fett. Oh my God. Like, yeah. Know, the, movie, the episode doesn't mean anything if you haven't, yeah. you really, if you haven't seen Clone Wars, honestly, like based on the movies alone, like you might recognize them, but also like who cares? Like, whatever. It's sort of like this, like, it, the weight of this episode largely stems from like a completely extra filmic sort of layer. Mm-hmm. that like is specifically for fans of the material and has nothing to do with the show up to this point or the films if you've seen those so i just think that that's interesting sort of like how the film the show isn't more in conversation with like the meta text of star wars than it is with the like the text of star wars a lot of the time um and we'll see how that pans out as this sort of chugs along i i'm curious to see how that reads and if it reads well um but the staff he has in the episode is like a it's a um it's a Tuscan Raider staff. Yeah, like I, w- I would say it definitely looks like that. I'm pretty sure it is. I'm pretty sure he just took took uh, it from one on Tatooine. Speaking of which, why didn't he just take his armor earlier? I'm like low key a little confused. Like he was on Tatooine for like six years or something. Yeah. The whole time, so he could have left just wandering around. But he also knew who had the armor because he name drops him mm-hmm. in this episode. So I'm like, why didn't you just go kill that man and take it yourself? Like I'm kind of confused what he was doing this whole time. Maybe they'll tell us. But like that was a little sort of like I need I need a little more on that. Yeah, I, I want yeah. I want to touch on a couple more things in the episode, but <laughs> I I want to definitely bring up my big concern going forward. Yeah. And as much as I enjoyed this episode, and I even like Boba Fett, and you're totally right, he did get a little less cool when he put on the armor. Even with the hero shots, they gave him like the big moments, and like isn't he so cool? And I'm like, <laughs> Tamara Morrison's cool. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. actually less without his face he's le- significantly less cool yeah and look there there's oh. this is not like an actual like issue you get older it's 2020 everyone puts on a little weight <laughs> but when you put on the armor you know he's a little he's a little heavier and i was just like it doesn't it doesn't sit cute. on him like it sat in attack the clones 
um, which you know is is fun. But that's the thing. Like he is he is sort of. But he, I wish that they had either adapted the armor or something just to make it sit on his body because it's not like he's like he's still like an intimidating presence. You know what I mean? It's not mm-hmm. like he just. He's not like you look at him and you're like, ah, oh, that's a dude who's past his prime. He just has that sort of like barrel sort of like older sort of man kind of girth to him but you yeah. need to like you need to adapt the armor to like fit that uh, just a bit i understand like you can't totally change it or else people will be like why does the armor look different but like mm. just like a little bit to like sit on him in a way that just feels a little bit more right the way it sits on mando the way it feels right on mando um just just work with it a little bit just, just make it sit on because again when he's wearing the cloak, he looks awesome. Like you can cost, it's not like, it's not like his body's in a place where like you can't costume him in a way that he looks intimidating. You know what I mean? You mm-hmm. can totally do it, but like they were just a little sticking a little too close, I think, yeah. it, with the it, original design that didn't flatter like him. Clunky. Like it kind of looked just clunky on him. It did. Although to be fair, it, it looked clunky on Timothy Oliphant early on the season too. So like, I <laughs> oh, don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the design is also just a little bit outdated. Like the way the shoulder pads like look, like they just don't in, in empire awesome. and stuff. When you look at that, you're like, yeah, okay. You know, like whatever, because it's an old movie and like the designs feel right in that context, but like, it just doesn't, it just doesn't like read that way anymore. Like in the cold, hard light of like, 8k digital camera you know it just doesn't it just doesn't look as cool as mando you know yeah. um so they, just, they should have done something else with it i don't know i, I think Which... the cape like he just needed the like, oh yeah the... i forgot about the cape yeah, yeah maybe like, maybe that would help sort that out but I, this still takes me back to my my big concern um so he loses ba- mandalorian loses baby yoda uh ship's gone and I think the 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 Beskar, I think it's called, right? The armor, mm-hmm. the Beskar armor. I think that's up next. And my concern when this show was first announced was like, oh, it's a Boba Fett show. No, it wasn't. Uh, I think the reason for him not taking the, the armor from Timothy Oliphant all those years, uh, the reason he's now helping Baby Yoda and like, I'm going to help you get the baby back because you gave me the armor. I think he's going to die and the Mandalorian is going to pick up that armor instead. And then it becomes like the not Boba Fett show because everyone loves Boba Fett. That would Now suck. that's, that's I... <laughs> cynical brain operating because that would be the worst case scenario for the show at this point, right? Mm-hmm. But like, I... I don't know. I feel it out on the horizon. It's possible. I really hope not just because like Mando's like own armor is like a really good design. Like it looks great on him. And like, I'm sorry, the Boba Fett armor is never going to look that cool. (laughs) Um, And also like, I'm just trying to think of like the way they could contort that story to even make that make sense. It's like, I mean, Mando's armor, it's like a holy thing to him. Like, I don't think he'd ever like willingly get rid of his own helmet and take on somebody else's helmet. Um, especially since they made such a big deal about it being Boba's in this episode. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, I see what you're saying. I was hoping not because like from a story perspective, there's no reason to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of the thing. Like Star Wars has been doing this dance for the past couple of years where it's like, I, they're, they're trying to, they're, they're having, sometimes having a challenge discerning what's like a good story choice and what is like just cathartic as like a fan, you know, like, again, like going back to, you know, not to harp on this too much because, you know, I, I, I work in this industry now and like, I, I, I want to respect everyone's work as much as I can and not, you know, not, not shade people for making decisions in really hard circumstances, but like there's the whole Ray Skywalker thing at end of Rise of Skywalker where it's just like, but like she's bearing Leia's lightsaber, like Luke hated this planet. And like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, she's bearing Leia's lightsaber and then she calls herself a Skywalker. But like her meaningful, like found family relationships were not with the Skywalkers. Like her relationship with Luke was just kind of combative and tense. And like her entire relationship with Leia was just with like Carrie Fisher's ghost. Uh, <laughs> who was just kind of talking like an eight ball at her the whole movie. And like her found family in the film, it's clearly like Finn and like BB-8 and stuff. And like, that's who it's sh- that should have from a from a purely from a character and story perspective the final beat should have been her saying i know who i am and i know who my family is and it's these people but instead they make her her found family the skywalkers despite 
her not having a real familiar relationship with any of the Skywalkers in that trilogy. But that's that's more of a meta textual gesture. It's more like because the name Skywalker means so much to the fans, mm-hmm. and it they choose that. You know, they went that route because and that's Star Wars more conversing with its meta text and with its text. You know, and I don't even think they realize that they were conversing with their meta text in that film. Like I think like it those things get so confused constantly in the minds of fans in the minds of people making it that like you don't even realize that you're not actually talking with star wars as it exists in the text of the films like you can't discern between those two things anymore because they all feel like one hodgepodge again like the boba fett thing the idea of boba fett being this important character he's literally not he's literally not and the idea that boba fett should have his own show like i remember when they first announced the mandalorian people thought it was going to be boba fett show i did it was like but but Boba Fett doesn't need his own show. Like there's no, there's literally no reason to give Boba Fett his own show. Like there's no character there to work off, not nearly enough to work off to make his own show. Um, But if you're engaging just with the meta text of Star Wars, just in the sense of like what people have sort of arbitrarily have decided is important, you could believe that he does. Um, And so like fans get that mixed up, the people making it get that mixed up for understandable reasons. But like that is a danger going forward with the show. I agree with you, Diego, um, in that in in that sense. So, like, I don't know if that's what they're going to do, but like, it's possible. And a lot of there's a lot of missteps they could take because of that exact same error. Actually, they you know even going back to like Force Awakens. Remember that moment where like Han and Chewie run on the ship? He's like, Chewie, we're home, you know. And it's in that exact same pose that's still from A New Hope, where they're like outside the Millennium Falcon, you know. Except mm-hmm. that still was a promotional still right it's only famous because it was using the advertising it's not an important shot in the movie it was just pulled and put in a bunch of advertising for the original star wars and so they reference the marketing for the original star wars han's reintroduction in force awakens is a is a homage to promotional material right not the movie you know and so but like but people don't you don't even realize you're like i guess reference the original star wars but it's really kind of not you know like and so these things just it's it's so muddy and like i really do think that if the series is going to survive like artistically like monetary monetarily totally different conversation i don't care about yeah. that but artistically they need to like have a really serious sort of like sit down and like try and like grasp like what is really the story and what is extraneous sort of metatextual sort of like fan shit that isn't really a story and ultimately cheapens the story we're trying to tell now yeah yeah, I mean, I hope they do that with uh, this like hiatus of uh, movies that came unintentionally. Yeah, they, they're definitely <laughs> rethinking some stuff. I don't know what lessons they're learning. I don't know if they're learning the right lessons. I do think that Mando being such a success out the gate, the fact that the first season was like so like beloved by so many people does worry me a little bit because I feel like the first season was like them not indulging their best storytelling impulses. And like, I'm concerned <laughs> that like they're going to learn that like, just like the most bare bones story with like a bunch of just like lore gestures just draped over top of it is like what Star Wars should be now because the fans mm-hmm. like the fans were like on board with Mando from episode one and episode one like all due respect to like the crew like come on guys like that wasn't yeah. a real show that wasn't a real show there's nothing no. happening you, you sh- yeah. uh, shout out to the first episode Gene and I did because we were like no we, we we're going in with an open mind <laughs> but we we basically hated it and to the it's point not where good. I guess, no, it's, it's not really a point. Bad. it's it's not good at all it's yeah. awful I mean, to, to the point where like we were like oh no when dave filoni was announced as another yeah. director for this season uh, and we were like oh no he's like something changed like he he's he's clearly like learning and stuff like that it's and not it, just filoni it's good. though the <laughs> pilot episode the script like it just oh, no, so no, many totally, things. totally yeah. it, it's because Filoni like can do things like you know he loves Star Wars he's he show run two good Star Wars shows like he knows how to do this shit it was just like just from a structural perspective they just they did not realize they didn't have a show it's and, and this is something I said on Twitter the other day Star Wars media should be judged like this if you can take away all the explicit Star Wars elements and just tell it as like a samurai story or a western and it's still good then it's good that is when you know you have a good show or movie, right? And to me, those are all the best Star Wars movies. Last Jedi, Return of the Jedi, Revenge of the Sith. Those are my three favorite Star Wars films. And like those are just robust dramas that you can take away all the Star Wars shit, shove it to the side. You know, Last Jedi can be, you know, a story about a young, 
a young warrior woman who goes to find like, you know, a, a fabled samurai master and he doesn't want to fight, you know, like you can make that movie and it's still good, you know, but I think Mandalorian, you strip away all the Star Wars stuff. It is just the most, the first like <laughs> couple episodes, the most boring, least interesting Western ever made like it is there's nothing happening he is a non-character there is a non-story it is absolutely nothing it's just all the star wars shit draped over it disguises the fact that it's not a show Mm -hmm. you know it's a little like god i'm about to make all the californians really mad at me but like it was kind of when i tried in and out burgers fries for the first time (laughs) and everyone's like no 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 no. you don't understand you have to give it you have to get it wild like what is it like wild style what is it animal animal style style? fries i I was just watching lego movie last night so the name wild style is in my head (laughs) animal style you have to get animal style it's like that's the only way to do i'm like no 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 no. all you're doing is putting a bunch of other shit on bad fries i don't know how to explain this to you they're still not good you you come into Um, my house (laughs) You you bring your, your you anti um, <laughs> like you know I'm right you know I'm right well, no you know, they're some, good I, would some, say, I love I love putting garbage into saying. my body I, that, I would say um, for In and Out fries my only defense is we have to put into context the price of In and Out look like, that's, that's, that's that, of course look that is the value that's, of In and Out it is incredible yeah. like one a.m. food that is cheap mm-hmm. as dirt and is also pretty good for like a for yeah. like a three dollar burger insanely good is it the best burger we've ever had you've lost your mind <laughs> um anyway that's not the point though it is the same thing with with Mandalorian where like they just like put a bunch of stuff on not good fries like fries <laughs> that were just not good like and, and it's all these gestures and references and like lore stuff and like People have become so obsessed with the window dressing that they have forgotten they need to like see out of the window. You know, yeah. like they're like, it's like, oh, this is a great window dressing. I'm like, but it's around, it's around a brick wall. Like you can't, you can't see, it doesn't function the way it's designed to. It's drapes over top of brick. Um, and eventually the show got around to like being a real show, but like mm-hmm. the fact that the first season was so like lauded by the fans like worries me a lot because like yeah like it just told them that they don't have to make real stuff they just need to make like the most bare bones nothing burger and the other the other big thing that's the other big thing this ties back to last jedi and stuff sorry if i'm being too long-winded here but like, no no no. The, oh okay. boy this is just the norm for the show this is okay. perfect thank you right <laughs> good like let's go back to last jedi star wars fans fans in general but like this has become really true of star wars fans this is this is what happens with in late stage fandom they start hating actual characters, like characters with traits that like make them uncomfortable or like have the potential to actually disappoint them or like whatever. Mm-hmm. Like they hate that. They hate characters that aren't like, cool. you know, I, I saw I saw this tweet the other day where it's like, oh, uh, like this, when we said we wanted strong female characters, we didn't want this. And it was like oh. an image of like, of like, of Laura Dern's character from Last Jedi, Grand Admiral Holdo. Grand Admiral, is she a grand? She's just uh, an admiral, though. Yeah, and then it was like, this is what we want. It shows like Ahsoka from Mandalorian. It shows, it shows. Uh, what's Gina Carano's character name? I'm sorry. Oh, Cara. Oh, Cara well, Dune. It was just a bunch of. It, it shows. It shows. <laughs> it shows. Um, it, it was. It was. Um, Bo Katan from Mandalorian is like, this is what we meant. I'm like, none of these in the context of the show are really characters. I love Bo Katan and I love Ahsoka, but like, they all they do in the episode is show up and be badass. They have no arc. They, they don't do anything that actual characters that drive story do. They have no dimension in the context of Mandalorian. I appreciate that I know where they are now because of my affection for them in the other shows, but they weren't really characters in this context. And also Cara Dune isn't really a character. She's just, she's just good at killing people, right? And so at the end of the day, the fans, every time they get upset about this kind of shit, they're like, this is what we actually want. They point to characters that aren't really characters, that are stock badasses that have like maybe one trait, but not really an interesting personality trait, you know? Like hates droids or like family died at some point, just things like that. And they're like, this is what we want more of. And it's like, this isn't, this is the most coddling infantile understanding of how story works. Um, and that's not to say I don't, again, in Mandalorian, there's more context for it because it's riffing on all these sort of shows and stuff that that are, you know, you know, man with no name, whatever, badass. is like, in the context of Mandalorian, I can kind of accept it. But like the idea that this is what Star Wars ought to be all the time, um, it's just a little unsettling for me. It's a little disturbing for me, you know? And like, that's really the root of the hatred of, of Luke's sort of stuff in Last Jedi is that the fact that they treat him like a person and not this like revered, icon who can't do anything wrong or anything disappointing um 
and and the more we've gone into it the more it's just become really apparent that the second characters start drifting toward real people and they start telling actual stories to the actual characters that they treat like fully dimensional emotional human beings not just stock characters that have like one meaningful relationship it's like oh mando and the baby you know that's like so easy to swallow it's so uncomplicated so unchallenging um fans hate that (laughs) fans hate that (laughs) fans hate that i'm like i'm worried like that we're going to see drift even further and further away from good storytelling and good character work because the fans are so oversensitive and are so hostile to any characterization that feels dangerous or disquieting or uncomfortable or challenging in any way. Yeah. I, I wonder, um, and I was wondering, you got, um, was it Andrew and uh, Diego's takes on this was, um, I wonder if uh, that, like that first season, the all the like the hype and kind of like cheerleading for it was just like on some like level, just this like act of like rebelling against, uh, say like the movies they didn't like, like the sequel trilogy and all that. Um, I don't know. I was kind of like I had this weird theory because it's I don't remember like the found the fans even like with like Force Awakens, which give or take some people like like being that loud, like oh this is awesome, this is the most amazing thing ever, like. Any, any, anyone's thoughts on that? Or am I just, I'll like, let, I have thoughts, but I'll let Diego go first. Cause yeah. I haven't shut the fuck up this whole podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I appreciate the not shutting the fuck up. The show is okay. not shutting the fuck up. It's, it's perfect. Love it. But like, I, I agree with that actually. And I think that, cause I've seen more criticism towards this season of the Mandalorian, which is like insane to me. Cause like, look, I, I think we've made it clear that Gene and I, that like, we're not in love with the show, but mm-hmm. we're enjoying it now. And Same. it is something Same. enjoyable to tune into and talk about, which was yeah. not the, the first. I remember. It's not the first I season. I, up, I think I remember bringing it up with Gene, like even on this, like the first episode, we were like, we like that. We thought about not doing this show anymore, but anyways. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, the same thing. I remember, like, I liked the final two or three episodes of season one, like a decent mm-hmm. bit. But I remember, like, before watching them, I was like watching with my brother and then my brother's best friend, who's like kind of like my cousin, like our, my adopted cousin, or my foundling cousin. Um, <laughs> and we were about to watch the finale, and like, the, we were like legitimately talking. And first, we're like, do we have to watch this? Like, is this like <laughs> is this really essential Star Wars viewing at this point? Like, it doesn't feel like it um and you're i had the exact same we we loved the finale we're like wait was that pretty good that was pretty good and then the season has been satisfying on the whole but like the exact same feeling and a friend of mine just started watching mandalorian who's a big star wars fan like literally the entire sequel trilogy actually and whoa you watched the first episode she was like this is doofy and i'm like i'm sorry (laughs) just keep watching i promise it gets good yeah yeah but like i i think these are very valid concerns to bring up because even though this season the biggest criticism that i also completely agree with is that like these are characters from other star wars properties that like are very niche they're for nerds like us like honestly right like i mean like there was even those reports about like the the clone wars viewings going up on disney plus because people saw ahsoka's episode and it's like well they want to know where she's from because not a lot of people saw it right to be fair clone wars is a better show than this and also ahsoka's better character than this (laughs) than than the characters on the show so like part of me is kind of like totally like part of me is like okay with it like i understand people's complaints so part of me is like okay with it becoming like a backdoor sort of like pilot for like a rebel sequel because like just by definition it's gonna be a better show yeah yeah Uh, especially especially clone wars which i think is just like has some absolutely highs, absolutely you know? just like when ahsoka showed up i was like oh right characters with an arc like i'm great awesome like <laughs> i love i i'm wait i'm ready for somebody to show up with like depth yeah yeah and like it's there's still not that like that great depth you want from these characters like the conflicts aren't really conflicts it's like hey we need your help we'll trade you your help here for giving you help later and it's like, like, like I'm I totally need, fine with I that. Need to it's protect like the child. They're like, okay, Mando, I have a little heist I need you to do. It's like, I don't want to do it, but I'll do it for some best car. And then, and then he does it. And then the episode kind of ends. And then he just sails off the baby. And it's like, okay, fine. But like, but like, like I, I want, I really, 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 really like the first real, real glimpse of like the show becoming like a deep show was when he had that sort of standoff with Bo-Katan and sort of his idea of identity and like the idea that being a Mandalorian isn't necessarily what he thinks it is and being challenged on that. And just like the idea of him being like this kid raised in this like fanatical cult who has to learn to be like a real person. And like, there's, there is such a story there and like they touched on it. Like, I'm really hoping that's like the arc that he's going to have over the course of the show because that's a real show. 
that feels mm-hmm. like Star Wars in the way that the in in it, that political sort of like social commentary sent like light, of course, not like super on the nose and like soapboxy, but just like touching on like real emotional, real world emotional dynamics and structural sort of like relationships um, that I think Star Wars excels at. And I'd be really interested to see them dive into. And that would be a great arc when and if they really commit to getting around to it. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, that, that's definitely my favorite episode. I, when I first saw it on the show, I said it, I liked the spider one more. Uh, like just looking back, like everything clicks in place on, for that third episode. On. For like, me, for me, it's a the tie. Were super fun. The spiders were fun, but for me, for me, it's a tie between that and last week. I know you didn't like last week as much as I like last week, Diego. But like for me, despite its flaws, last week was like, I this is a show. Like this is a real show that has like atmosphere and like is pulling. Again, it's it's the difference between like the set pieces in last week and the set pieces in this week is that this week it felt like standard action in anything. Like mm-hmm. I I could have seen that in a lot of different things but like last week felt directed in such a way that was like so just like that face off between her and the magistrate like while mando and like the 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 guy outside are sort of waiting to see who wins and just like (laughs) like when the magistrate like dings the staff on the ground like like readies up just like and everything about it was just i was like ah like (laughs) directorial choices like they felt like real directorial choices and like feloni was enjoying it that he really went back and watched like 50 classic samurai movies for watching you know just that kind of thing whereas this this week was kind of like eh, it was just this action it was action yeah. you know like they yeah. show up they're shooting and they wacky whatever you know um that last week felt like a real so to me it's kind of a tie for different reasons between last week and the bo katan episode mm-hmm. um but yeah i don't know why i was going off on that but i was just yes no, I, no. I, we, I, we, we have concerns point. it turns yeah. out all of our concerns are alleviated when they go to magic planets that actually feel alien yes like I, I think that's the big thing like the strength of this season so much more than the first season which is also why it's like concerning to hear people are like starting to criticize this one more which again <laughs> is generally I, it's I insane i'm um, yes but like the idea that like like come on now like like how yeah, can you like, not be criticizing the first season and start criticizing have you what what is happening in these people's brains i don't get yeah. it i mean like even going back to tattooing the first episode i just remember watching that being like fuck like the uh, first no exactly no i was just like so oh bad. my god and now it's like it was just like so exciting and yeah. like the world feels like a world I, you know? I said this on twitter but like i really wish that this premiere had been the first tatooine episode like i wish we had just not gone in season one at all and like had handled that entire sort of like whatever needed to happen that episode just handled it differently because like this Tatooine episode was so much better. Then again, we've only had so many episodes. We should not have been to Tatooine twice, let alone <laughs> maybe even <laughs> once in the show. Honestly, yeah. we don't need Tatooine. We don't need deserts in Star Wars anymore, like moratorium on deserts completely. Like, cause we don't need it. And like, and you know, to your point about alien worlds, th- this has actually been a problem for me a bit in Star Wars, like recent Star Wars, specifically the sequels, actually, I felt this was a serious issue. Like starting in Force Awakens, it was like deserts, forest, desert, forest, forest, <laughs> more forests. I'm like, stop it, <laughs> stop it. Uh, it got a little better in Last Jedi. And then it it got, it was, Skywalker was, you know, there was another, there was another desert. I forgot about Fasana. There was another desert, Jesus Christ almighty. Yeah, but it, um, there's Coachella on that planet, yeah. which is <laughs> kind of fun. Then they, um, then they throw in like a ice planet or like Mustafar, but then they don't tell you. There was Mustafar in the opening. That looked, Mustafar looked amazing in the opening. Yeah. Scene. That was like the one planet that looked awesome. I guess the Sith planet looked kind of cool, although I was right. kind of like vague on what it was. Um, but just in general, like the prequels, people rip on the green screen or whatever. I don't care. The prequels design wise, in terms of the designs of the planets mm-hmm. is the best Star Wars has ever looked. Mm-hmm. Like without a question in my brain, Coruscant is incredible. Naboo, amazing. Felucia, great. Geonosis. Geonosis is a better kind of desert because it looks like a completely different kind of desert than the other deserts in the series. Camino, like, and here's the thing. I understand the issues about green screen, but I'd rather alien worlds that looked a little fake than just fucking California or whatever. Like, I, it's just so much better. And with the, with the stagecraft, they can do it in so, so well. You know? They can mm-hmm. do it so well. And, like, there's no reason to not always do it in Mandalorian. I don't need just some hill in america somewhere like i, I really don't <laughs> yeah like i, I don't want to see this kind of planet at least for the rest of the season if we go back to another planet, just like 
I don't want to see it ever. <laughs> or at least if you're going, like, I understand, like, taking an environment that might be kind of in, kind of familiar and, like, heightening it. Like, Yavin 4 is kind of that. You have these amazing, mm-hmm. big, like, pyramid temples, dense, lush forest. This, it was sort of just, like, anywhere I drive in California with, like, a little, a couple Jedi rocks on top of a hill. Like, I just, anything, yeah. anything more than that. Just give me a little more, you know? Yeah, yeah, like... Yeah. Yeah, more, more, more of that. Um, oh my God, I, I totally lost the train, a train of thought for uh, something about the, the green screen. I don't know. Come, uh, come back to me. I had, yeah. I had a bit about that for the finale. I, I oh, about the, the green screen for the finale. Did you have like a planet you wanted them to go to or something? No, no, no. I, I'm totally open to them. Just keep. Here you go. I'm totally open to them just to continue experimenting with like the look and the palette of the show. Uh, I. I need them to be real places. Like, here's the difference between, like, Tatooine uh, versus, like, the prequel planet Sego, where, like, Tatooine's a backwater planet that's not supposed to inhabit life. Like, the point of it is it's supposed to be a lifeless planet. Yes, it's trash. It's Conti- like two cities. <laughs> yeah, and, like, to continue to use that as the template of, like, oh, isn't it so nostalgic that we're going back to Tatooine? Like, no. you Would you be nostalgic to go to, like, the local, like, Trash department. No, you know? no. It's like it's 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 Kansas. It's like no. Why are you going here all the time? Like, <laughs> like, and that's the thing. Here's the thing. It, it the funny thing is that it is this backwater planet that means nothing, but like it does have some emotional meaning to the characters in certain mm-hmm. certain characters in certain ways. So like my question, but the, the the thing about that is that by constantly returning to it with like every possible character, even ones who don't have any connection to it, you're mm-hmm. cheapening its potential for power when you could have been really selective about going back. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. if it was just like I hadn't seen Tatooine since like the prequels and like a character for whom it made sense like ended up back on Tatooine just like incidentally you know like and I hadn't seen it for years then I would have feel differently but like we've seen Ta- we saw Tatooine in Rise of Skywalker you know we've seen it in Rebels a couple times for for good reasons I'll grant that um Mandalorian we saw it for no reason in the first season um you know and then on top of that like I'm sorry <sighs> Jakku counts as tattoo. I don't care. Tatooine. I don't care. Jakku, it, Jakku counts as Tatooine. J- Jakku is crappier Tatooine. Like, it's like Tatooine, but like, it's like, what if we take all the interesting building designs and just replace them with just like, just a mishmash of tents that like have like no, have no d- memorable design elements like at all? Um, Jakku sucks. Um, and Jakku is just Tatooine. Is, is diet Tatooine, right? And so like, I, I by having so much Jakku, like I didn't get that reset either. Um, I never had, we should be able to have a wide berth of absolutely no Tatooine so that when we get more Tatooine, it has some meaning, but we never got that because we're either getting Tatooine or tat- plants that are exactly like Tatooine. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's robbed Tatooine of any potential power that it had. Because yeah. they don't know how to do things outside of just going back and like hitting that nostalgia button over and over, <laughs> over and over again, being like, "Do you like us now? We please like us. We want you to like Star Wars again." Um, yeah. yeah, it's annoying. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for like whatever leaked Chris Terrio story decision uh, to bring back Tatooine comes out. Well, uh, I feel I, like that was a JJ thing. That was yeah. Honestly. Come on, okay. now. come on now. The, the Chris Terrio stuff that was like the sith planet like everything yeah. on everything on what's it what was the planet called it has a Exegol. name Exegol. Exegol, how I remember actually that. pretty good actually good i i knew that somewhere in my head i also like i play do they have an Exegol planet battlefront i don't remember but like that that was terio stuff like that was to me at least that was pretty clearly mm-hmm. terio stuff like just like it's this big ridiculous lightning planet where there's like a stadium everything is like feels like it's about gods and like what it feels like batman versus superman okay <laughs> oh, is what totally, exegol feels yeah. like to me then like you know what honestly i i'm not like i that was like the saving grace of rise of skywalker for me if i'm being real like i i don't think like because people are like oh no chris terrio showed up and ruined it but like honestly <laughs> everything that doesn't work about the movie is very clearly jj to me like i'm not saying that chris terrio is necessarily like the writer for stars i'm not saying that his contributions were like good from a story perspective but it at least made the movie weirder in a way that like made it like slightly more watchable than if, if it had been like what force awakens was which force awakens on the story level is a better movie but like it's also like I have so much less to talk about in Force Awakens because, like, Rise Skywalker is like insane and all over the place and not good, but like, I can talk about insane and all over the place in a way that I can't <laughs> talk about, like, whatever was happening in Seven. 
that's like that's still i think your your worst take no not, worst not, take. not worst it's just the one i'm most combative about because about I, force I just, awakens yeah, uh, force yeah but... and then and then here's the here's what happened diego i said all this shit about force awakens you're like no 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 it's all about it's about it's about legacy it's 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 a commentary on on on, on inherited trauma and blah 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 mm-hmm. and then it's like no 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 and the proof is that you know once it, in the next movies they're gonna go do different stuff it's gonna go branch off into exciting uh-huh. places it's a springboard for the story that they really <laughs> intended to tell and then you watch this shit and like it's not and like it was obviously never gonna be don't lie to me diego like like he's <laughs> a good pilot and the it's fact it's literally not it's literally not and then and then and then the thing that kills me is that this is coming directly off of star trek into darkness which is like uh, he's playing uh, his hands so obviously and then in force awake it's just him like tripling down on all these exact same instincts and i was like but no here it's meaningful in star trek into darkness it was dumb but here now that he's doing it more it's like meaningful <laughs> commentary on shit diego you can like the movie all you like but don't lie to me like about what this is. i i think it still totally works there and to bring it back to mandalorian i think force awakens still totally works there and visually apart from like the actual like excitement of the camera movements and stuff like that mandalorian season two kind of wipes the floor with it just like on a technical level which is just like something i never even thought i'd say out loud yeah ever. yeah well and also just because like I mean, A, like, and it's just like, look, everybody, I like JJ's style in certain contexts, but like, you know, I've always complained about like how that visual style was applied to Force Awakens and just like with the constant whip panning and just like unmotivated dolly movements. Like the camera always has to be like, like right up in someone's face, you know, like it's just, it's like moving. It's like, aren't you excited? I'm like, it's just a couple people in suits talking in a ship. Like I don't need it whipping between <laughs> them every single time. Um, but to me, like the visual language in Mandalorian is much more measured and mm-hmm. feels more in the vein of classic samurai movies, whatever. And I think that's part of it. Like you're applying these great like planet designs like that fishing planet in episode three, it looked great. Um, and just these, these measured sort of like thoughtful camera movements that also don't date it. That's the other big thing about good visual Star Wars is that they know when to employ certain techniques to punctuate certain beats like Lucas and Revenge of the Sith like when he does that like moment where it's like eye on like Grievous's eyes he's like you are doomed and everyone's like I don't think so and it's like it's just an <laughs> eyes and then in, in, in Attack of the Clones they do a bunch of like J.J. Abrams like snap zooms actually like during during the Battle of Geonosis like they do all these snap like out of nowhere but it like works as like you're doing a bit in a certain scene but like the Star Wars anchors itself in a very straightforward, very sort of understated visual language that won't date it. Um, and I think that that's really important to it aging well. I, I'm curious to see how visually Force Awakens and Rise of Skywalker age. I don't, I don't personally think they're going to age as well as the other ones just because they're so flashy almost um but we'll see we'll see I, I, but for me that's the key to why mandalorian is looking as good as it is because it isn't like it's it's smart about when it employs what it employs visually yeah also we, we got to be real just with, with television production it, it's different from film so that it's probably just true. easier to, to set up like here we just need the coverage on this right know? no that, that's which, also which, you know, it works in its favor honestly absolutely absolutely yeah. it, it does we need a uh, helicopter, like a. Uh, was it was it a helicopter shot at the end of Force Awakens? The it hover- was a helicopter. <sighs> God, God, the okay. fact here's okay. Look, okay. look, look. I'm sorry. <laughs> I every single Star Wars movie had ended with such a specific painterly frame, mm-hmm. and then to have it like this spinning helicopter <laughs> going around. The, I was just like, it just made the cut to title feel like the cut to like credit feel wrong to me. Like there was something about like. It's not like an image. It was just kind of like, it was just like, it, it was it was the look of that movie. Like, you know, like that, that, that in a mo in a moment, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, yep, that's, that's how this movie looks. It's just, it's, is the camera moving? No, move it. Like, it needs to be moving. <laughs> Um, especially since they had they could have had such an incredible frame like behind Ray, like maybe Luke silhouetted just her arm extended with the lightsaber just like this painterly like 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 the the what's what's that painting you know like the the god touching Dave, david or whatever oh, oh yeah 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 like well, kind, not an exact adam yeah yeah was yeah it is adam god what am i talking about god i was i was 
a deep religious person for a very long time what, what the fuck is happening but like not exactly that but you know like like that moment like like you know luke above herbal it could have been like this incredible like final frame and instead it's just the helicopters spinning <laughs> around him um but like to me like i i think that the mandalorian has been really good at finding those frames like just in general to find like that that moment like after in last week's like when Ahsoka is just standing in the mist, like in, with her lightsabers, then deactivates them and sort of like fades into the mist. Like I tweeted this still, I think. And it's just, it's such a good image. Like just as like a beat. And like, that's, you punctuate your shot, your scenes with paintings. That's Star Wars to me. That's like a big part of what Star Wars is to me. And Mandalorian has really figured that out. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of figuring things out, uh, after the, the little revelation at the, what, like two episodes ago or something, when they find out that the Empire is kind of coming back on that, on that Navarro, I think the yeah. planet's called, yeah. whatever. Uh, and I was trying to figure out like, oh, those, those little troopers at the end, those are droids. And you told me, no, they're not. They're, they're stormtroopers with jetpacks. And they I are know, droids. <laughs> you told me they weren't droids. And I was like, no, no, no. Okay, I'll bring it up in the episode. All right, no problem. They're, oh, wait, wait, are, they're are, are you saying he told you that or I told you that? No, you answer. You no, 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 like, no, 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 no. I said you said they're droids. I said they're specifically dark troopers. Dark troopers are droids. No, no. I will literally. I will. Go, I'm going to Diego. I swear to Christ. I'm going to go into our Twitter DMs. I'm going to find exactly <laughs> what I said. I literally linked to you you to the Wikipedia article where it describes them as droids. I okay. You probably did, <laughs> but I didn't read that. Yeah, need to put I, that. Put yes, that, they've kept to that still. They've, they've been droids. They've <laughs> been droids. I was okay, just, well I was then saying, I, I misread I that. I was like, oh, okay, there's suits of saying, armors. I was saying specifically, those are dark troopers. Okay, well, yeah, I guess they're, 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 they they're come in the episode. Droids. Droids. That's what you thought. I played Battlefront. That's what thought. <laughs> well, they're in the episode. They're cool. They yeah, do a thing. Cool. Yeah, whatever. They, I, I like the look of them. I like, I like that battle droids are still in Star Wars. Right. Even though right. you know they had such a bad reputation, and it's like I would love. I don't want stormtroopers all the time. Sorry. I would love for a reprogrammed like battle droid, battle droid to be a character in something like just with a different character's brain, but like literally just a battle droid from the prequels. Just like make this a character. Just. I just I think that would be so funny. Oh, like uh, Andrew, we, we have had of, super battle droids in this though. Yeah, we kind of had that in Rebels with that one we, character. We did, we did for yeah. a little bit, a little bit. Um, but yeah, we did e- even in the first season of this, we had like super battle droid cameo in his flashbacks, um, which was kind of which was kind of cool. But again, like I know that like I'm a sucker for prequel stuff, but like I do need more than just like references. I need more than callbacks. Like if Rise of Skywalker proved anything, it's just like calling back to stuff I like. Like I, when Force Awakens came out, I was like, "Is this just because it's not going back to the stuff that I'm nostalgic for? Is that is that the problem? Is is it that it's it's shunning the thing that I was attached to in Star Wars? Then like later they started pandering to prequel stuff, and I'm like, no, no, that's not it. That's 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 not the issue. It's not about pandering. We need story underneath all of this. Everyone's favorite wedge Antilles, <laughs> uh, but. To, to, to wrap Rise this of Skywalker, up, I mm-hmm. yeah, uh, no, he he pops up there and he's like, "Nice three, shot, Lando!" And everyone cheered because that's everyone's favorite three character. Seconds. I three don't. Like, of Wedge. I legitimately don't remember what Wedge does in the original trilogy. Um, no, he's he's in it. I know he is because I remember. No, that's it. <laughs> I, <laughs> they say they say Wedge a couple times, but like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, again again the meta text of star wars overtaking the text like that is the ultimate example like and also like the the um the whole controversy about admiral akbar not being uh, like, it's like guys <laughs> admiral akbar wasn't like a, a character you know that like he said a couple li- he was a side he was a side character like i don't like, i'm trying to imagine anybody like doing this shit about characters from like the prequels like imagine if like people were like really psyched about like captain panaka coming back and like them doing <laughs> captain panaka dirty it's like <laughs> nobody would do that but because like everyone thinks like every every single thing that appeared in the original trilogy is like critically like existentially <laughs> important like every single person who ever appeared in those movies needs to like needs to have a hero shot it's like i don't yeah. Do they? Like, <laughs> does anyone does anyone remember where they were? They someone said uh, 
if they redid the Holdo scene, but with like Akbar, and it's like, why? <laughs> right. No, that's what I'm saying. It's like, <laughs> why? And like the entire point of the character is like nobody knows who they are and like don't doesn't trust her because they don't know. Like they don't have a relationship with her. If it was Akbar, there would be no conflict. You know, yeah, Han and, and Poe already would get along. They know each other. Yeah. Then that's weird too, where Akbar is just like a cute kind of Muppet character, and you turn him into like a like a like a sacrificial like right like yeah. why like what's the point like the entire like yeah this is what this is again this is just what happens when people don't understand that characters like are specifically designed to play specific roles in a story like it's just all about star wars that is unfortunately this is true of just this is this is true of the marvel cinematic universe too not to dive into that whole thing but like marvel's been doing this shit they too do it where it's just the like time. they do it all the time where it's just like it's it's these gestures that exist in a vacuum and have nothing to do with anything like in in endgame that moment where where captain america picks up thor's hammer like the way it plays it's this big triumphant beat as if it's the end of someone's character arc except that character arc never happens it has nothing to do with anything it's just a thing it's just a thing that happens it's like it's it's like they instead of telling stories um you know these franchises have slowly drifted into this space where they've reverse engineered what what the ends of stories feel like you know like they 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 they've studied the big like it's like in, in return of the king like imagine if in return of the king they had that moment where the Gimli's like, I never imagined I'd die fighting side by side with an elf. And Legolas is like, what about side by side with a friend? He's like, I can do that. But what if like they had never established there was any animosity between elves and dwarves retired to that point? Like, what if that was just like a thing that happened and people in the audience were like, oh, but it would be like, it would have come from nowhere. It means nothing. And so like, but that's the problem. They're discovering that fans don't get really uncomfortable when you actually have characters do things that constitute an arc that make these payoffs feel meaningful. Like if Captain America had somehow failed in a way that would have made him like, say, say he, he, he had done something that made him unworthy of Thor's hammer earlier on in the series. And like, and, and Thor not being able to use Thor's hammer got someone killed. Right. Yeah. And it's because he wasn't worthy. He had done something very specifically wrong. That would be something pretty bad for Captain America. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that whole thing would have been, upsetting it would have been controversial because they would have been like no captain america never would have done that not my captain america how dare you how dare you make captain america problematic like and what i'm not mocking like social justice issues here i'm just saying they call like every character having traits at this point problematic um <laughs> that's there's that's... real problematic shit i'm not saying that this shit isn't actually problematic y'all anybody <laughs> who follows me on twitter knows that like there's real problematic shit but like people get really cavalier with these kind of labelings yeah. and so instead of doing that, they just make the end of that beat. They just pretend there was an entire story there or make it feel like it's it's capping off something that meant something at some point, but it didn't. <laughs> and so you have these franchises figure out how can we have all these payoffs without make, telling this kind of stories, telling an actual story and risk making people uncomfortable. You know, you can see them yeah. doing these calculations where they're trying to have all these sort of like cathartic moments that cap off arcs that never happen. That, um, that oh, I was gonna say that was interesting too. The the point you made with uh, Thor's hammer because the uh, opposite of that is like when Cap finally gets his shield back, it's like this weightless moment. It's just like Tony right. handing him the shield. It's like, hey, here you go. When that should have maybe that should have been the moment replaced with uh, Thor's hammer right there. Probably, but like, yeah. but like, who knows? Like at this point, and and I I don't know how I got on this, but like I I <laughs> it's I was just talking about like gestures you know mm -hmm. these 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 movies and shows pretending to be stories and then just capping it off with a bunch of gestures that give the they're like life model decoy <laughs> narratives you know <laughs> they're not real they're like pretending they're doing everything in their power to pretend to be the thing without actually you know having if they had like an actual heart it would risk you know getting damaged you know and they can't risk that so they don't put that in there they just do all the other things around it what was the thing that prompted me to say this i was saying this about something specific and now i've completely lost the fucking plot i think it was about i know we started with the dark troopers uh mm -hmm. which you were wrong about and then we started going down the path of like of other stuff i don't know we're, we're complaining about star wars fans we, yeah, we do that. I, a when lot am on I not? Show. When am I not? I don't know. <laughs> That's just me on my whole Twitter. If if you like complaining about Star Wars fans, please follow me on Twitter because I am. I they get mad at me 
all the time. <laughs> I've been embroiled in like so many non controversies about Star Wars, <laughs> about like the dumbest shit on earth. Um, because I say shit that makes Star Wars fans upset, like you know, like Kylo Ren isn't Ray's soulmate, and you know, cool. things like that. Things that that are really controversial and and, and insensitive for me to say, you know. That kind of thing. I saved a meme of you after a certain uh, oh, someone no. sent some followers after you. Oh, which yeah. I thought was hysteric. I'm sure that you remember it. A, oh, yeah. No, I that was good. Goodness, we're coming up not, not quite a year, but like that was a whole moment. And like, I feel there was a beat where I was like, was I in the wrong? And then I've decided I'm not. I don't give a shit. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, no, you weren't. Because when someone I, with like a million yeah. followers yeah. is like, here's someone with like, I mean, you have a Twitter presence, but you know, none of us are like the yeah, biggest person like, on Twitter. No, I don't have so. like I don't have like a multi-million follower YouTube account. And here's the thing: when I tweeted that, the fun here's the thing that kills me about this: I wasn't using like my big platform to talk shit and bully somebody. I literally tweeted something, and it got really popular because people fucking agreed with it. Like a bunch <laughs> of people with ma- major followings retweeted it because like, yep, that's right. And like, and then then he got mad about it, and then he's like, oh no, he, you know, this. AB Avalon on Twitter blocked me. And it's like, well, yeah, I, for the record, just, just, I don't know if anybody who's going to listen to this who gives a shit, but like, I just feel the need to put this out there. I, I, as, as soon as people started snitch tagging him, I blocked him because I was like, I don't need this heat. Like, I tweeted this shit, like, mostly for like the 500 people who followed me at the time, or whatever it was. I, yeah, I only had like 500 followers at the time. Like, whatever. Like, I was bitching about the same stuff I bitch about with stars, YouTubers, and fans in general, whatever. And then I blocked him because I was like, oh, no, it's going to be turned into a whole thing. And then, like, I basically stopped looking at Twitter for the day. And then I came back at, at the end of the day. I was like, what? <laughs> what, is what is this? And then he made a whole 20-minute video about how it was <laughs> bullying him and shit. Oh, I was like, come on. He, he was like, I, I, he used the word oppressed in this context. <laughs> I was like, guy, guy, oh, look, God. we can have a conversation about this. But, like, he's, like, literally like you multi-million youtube follower mm-hmm. white guy mm-hmm. like who has opinions about star wars on the internet like i'm sorry like you're not oppressed like you can't use words like this <laughs> in this context and then like i unblocked him on twitter because i was like well i guess i have to you know and then he was like he kept acting like the crime was that like i had blocked him so i unblocked him. i was like okay let's talk and he didn't want to talk so i was like okay <laughs> That's yeah. fine. I was like, but you sicked like your bajillion weird, weird followers on me. They're so weird. They're also like so homophobic and like transphobic and everything. And then as soon as I was like, you sicked all your like homophobic fans and like racist fans on me. He was like, those aren't my real fans. I'm like, why are they here? Like they're only <laughs> here made the video, dude. Like if they're watching your shit and like they're swarming me. So like clearly they're your, whatever. I, I just... I have never litigated that since it happened and since that just got brought up again. Like, I felt the need to say that just because, like, that was such a silly, insane couple of days. Yeah. They got tired eventually because they're all, like, 14. Uh, <laughs> sort of um, they, you know. Uh, they, you know, they got tired of, tired of it eventually. Uh, yeah. But that was such a weird... God, God. All I said was that I thought he didn't understand Star Wars. Like, that's like all I said. That was my crime, was <laughs> tweeting that this dude who makes a living off of Star Wars videos doesn't understand Star Wars very well. And <laughs> that was it. And that that was akin. He, at one point, compared it to, like, death threats. Like, I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, it's not. It's not that. <laughs> it's not that. Whatever. Well, I mean, it, to, to, to kind of wrap wrap this up then, like, that is kind of the whole like mentality that we were talking about, about like these Star Wars fans that are like, oh, the, the Star Wars is this because I, I say it is and I think it is. And this is what can be Star Wars. And I, yeah. I know what I'm talking about because of my million followers on YouTube. Right. And then the moment it's questioned, it's like, well, why would you say that? <laughs> right, you're, right. You're, you're well, bullying yeah, me. What, what, what They're so fragile. Right, they're so insecure. It's, there's so, this fragility. I don't even, you know, funny enough, I don't even know if he's like one of the worst examples of this. Like I've seen, I had seen a couple of his videos years ago. I do not watch his channel, especially not now. But like, <laughs> like I don't even know if he's the one of the worst of these. Because uh, there's like, there's obviously there's like channels that like, his channel doesn't even do this. Like there's channels that like peddle an outright like just flagrant toxicity. Like everything they, every time like I search up something Star Wars related on YouTube, I started getting all these insane recommendations from just like the most abhorrent, terrible people like on earth. 
who are just like, you know, like the, the, every single video is just inflammatory and mean and cruel and like yeah. racist and homophobic and shit. And then it's always these same people that as soon as like any, any like director, anybody involved in Star Wars just like says anything back against them, they're always like, you can't say that I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Star Wars. You can't treat me like this. It's like, you're, anyone can treat you like this. First of all, like you're an ass. Um, <laughs> but also just like this entitlement. There's just this, this, and it's not specific to Star Wars. I was tweeting about this the other day. I, I'm, and you know, we talked about this a little bit, Diego, when it was like, there's some YA author who like was tweeting that she wished Jack Black was Star Lord in Guardians of the Galaxy because he wouldn't have forgotten the girl's name at the beginning of the movie. Like, you know, how Star Lord doesn't remember the girl's name who he slept with. And I'm like, first of all, Jack Black, Jack Black doesn't, Chris Pratt didn't show up and like write the script. He, Star Lord wasn't a misogynist because Chris Pratt showed up. Like, <laughs> it's not how films work. Also, the idea that Jack Black would just like willfully erase like the character's like major flaw. Like, Jack Black understands story, I think. Like, why would you get rid of the thing that the character needs to overcome? Like, he doesn't give a shit about people. Like, that's the point. But there's just this like, it's just whether whether they're on that side of the spectrum where like everything is sort of like problematic or whether or they're on the sort of right side of the spectrum where like everything is like everything is like a progressive like le liberal sort of scheme to force them to like women um <laughs> uh, force women down their throat or whatever there's just this like they live in this like childish like bubble where like the thing they like always must cater to their interests and their sensitivities and their, you know, whatever. And they just do not understand that art isn't like about them. You go experience art because somebody else is putting something into the world. I went and saw Star Wars, not because it was what the fans made, but because it was what George Lucas made. And the funny thing about all this, all these motherfuckers acting like they're defending George Lucas, but all this shit, they're like, oh, I'm a Lucas, Lucas diehard, Lucas forever. Lucas said, I, I, I need to find the quote. It was during press for Attack of the Clones, I think. Or Revenge of the Sith, he, two different quotes. One was for, during press for Attack Clones. He was like, I love fans. Fans made, you know, are the reasons I'm still able to make these movies, but I can't make these movies for fans. He like said that, like verbatim. He said, I cannot make movies for fans. I basically, he has to make movies for himself because that's what art is. It is self-expression, you know, and you share it with other people. And those other people either appreciate it or they don't, but it's about you as an artist. It's not about ticking a bunch of boxes. It's not about checklists for other people, for like a mass horde of like million, millions, millions of people who all have different opinions. You can never make something coherent for it, even if you wanted to. Um, and in Revenge of the Sith, he was like, this is my movie. I made it. If you don't like it, you don't have to see it. Like he literally said that, you know, that was his mindset, you know, and the way to make Star Wars valid is just keep doing that. You know, that's what Ryan Johnson did. He made his movie and whether you like it or not, he made it, you know, and, and that's Star Wars when it's great and the people who think they're defending lucas don't understand that because lucas is never catering to them the fact that people hated the shit out of the prequels when they came out is proof of that y'all came around in the prequels it didn't start this way you know lucas made real movies and then eventually you got on board because they were real movies you know but at the time real artists have to endure the fact that people are going to hate real artists working in a franchise space have to accept the fact that people are going to hate the shit out of the fact that they made a real movie whether it's shane black with iron man 3 whatever the hell it is if they make a real movie, they're going to be in trouble because fans don't like real movies. But hopefully it will pay off down the line um, and people come around to it, which seems to be the case in most of these cases, Matrix, sequels, whatever it is. Um, but it is, it is a challenging thing because you know these franchises, they want the immediate gratification of just like studying what fans want and then making these films that like, like films and shows that hit at the very beginning and then faded into nothingness because they, there wasn't a real film underneath. It was just service over the top of it. Um, so all that to say, the fans don't know what makes good art. You know, and they don't have a healthy relationship with them. And um, I don't think that it's wrong or unkind to call that out when you see it in these fan spaces, these people who are dominating the conversation around Star Wars, you know, who have the ear of the studios in a way that they really shouldn't. Um, and, you know, they need to be able to take these criticisms like adults and start engaging with art like, a, like an adult. Yeah. Uh, if they want this thing that they supposedly love to survive in any meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the greatest danger to Star Wars, apart from like, you know, the movie industry stuff, which is just in a- Fans are a bigger danger to Star Wars than yeah. anything. <laughs> Fans are a bigger danger to Star Wars than COVID. I don't give a fuck. Like. <laughs> <laughs> 
the fans are the real empire. No, I'm not uh, gonna make stuff like that. But but also, uh-huh. um, on that note, uh, what are we looking forward to, and where can people find us online? What, what are we looking forward to with the Star Wars of of, of uh, my my boy <laughs> Bill Burr is coming back? Hell <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love Bill Burr in season one. Like his I, his that entire crew was so fun. I I really I really hope there's a scene with like Bill Burr and uh, the character that shouldn't be named. And uh, that character is just saying, like, uh, to open up the space businesses again. And Bill Burr just <laughs> to put on a fucking mask. We're talking about a particularly <laughs> newly minted rebel, uh, re- rebel, rebel uh, uh, captain. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, Look, at this point, you could, you could, there could be a couple of characters who you do not be named in, in, the, in this show. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but no, like, yeah, no, I mean, I am psyched. I'm psyched for Bill Burr. I'm excited for, I'm excited for Rick to be back in the director's chair, writing and directing oh, chair. Sure. Like, I like the idea of him having like his episode every season. Like that's fun <laughs> to me because his, his, his last one, the one last season was the best like one-off. Like it was the mm-hmm. best sort of like self-contained episode, I would argue. So I'm excited, excited to see what he does there. I'm excited to see the finale. Who knows what's going to happen there, but like, I'm definitely looking forward to it. And just like I just I'm I'm not excited to see what movies they announce for Star Wars in the future, but I am just you know I'll keep my ear open. Like we'll see what happens. Like I, I I'm open. I'm open. I'm always gonna be open to Star Wars, even if I don't like what happened. Yeah. yeah. Uh, go go ahead, Gene. Then I'll, I'll wrap oh, up on my thoughts. Yeah. Too. Um. Yeah. I'm looking forward to Bill Burr for sure. Um. You know, just if there's any Bill Burr things from like Zombievers to whatever, it's all interesting um but yeah i'm looking to the rick i'm looking forward to rick famiola hopefully have like another indiana jones reference since there was like a random last crusade reference in the last season and uh yeah yeah just uh, just seeing how this all plays out uh i i hope Kara dune doesn't stick around and i'm looking forward yeah. to more bill burr there you go <laughs> yep yeah. there you go yeah. Oh wait, are we supposed to plug our Twitters or something? Is that how this? Oh, yeah, I was about to. I was about to. Head <laughs> My Twitter that, handle um, is is a underscore b underscore Allen. That's it. Just on Twitter. That's really the only place you need to find me. I don't post. Well, I guess I do post things on Instagram, but you can you can just start with Twitter, and you know you'll acclimate <laughs> to me, or you won't. You'll you'll figure out whether or not you want to be following me on based on Twitter. That in that, some ways, be enough. your Twitter is the last Jedi of film Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what that means but i like it well i like that movie a lot so. i like that movie a lot too yeah so it's a, it's a thumbs up for me oh, thank you diego <laughs> and thank thank you for joining us it, it was it was a light to have you i'd love to have you back on again sometime and thank you uh, we'll, we'll, for we gotta go back me. we've got to go back to our uh our, our zoom calls where we just shit talk please other stuff please <laughs> that was thank fun. you for having me on to just fucking just ramble like nobody's <laughs> business I appreciate that. <laughs> no, no, of course. That's that's what we do here. We ramble. We talk about hopefully some stuff we like, which turned out to be most of the season so far. So yeah. fingers crossed on all that. Uh, Gene, where can the people yeah. find you too? No, oh, no. I was just going to thank Andrew for being on the show. And yeah, I always uh, appreciate your uh, like just Star Wars insight. Online. Thank you. Yeah, that's really good. Um, but yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, Gene9892. And you can find me at the Diego Crespo on Twitter and check out the Waffle Press on Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, and Patreon. We can get early access to other stuff we got going on, like our next episode of the Morning Movie Show. So get a little uh, interview about filmmaking during COVID, uh, post-production with a, with a friend of ours, and uh, just kind of, you know, the generic, like, how to get started as a filmmaker thing, but, like, with actual, like, results about that conversation. And that was a great episode, honestly. So I can't really wait to, to share it with everyone. And again, Andrew, thank you so much for coming on with us. It's a delight. Uh, thanks for listening. Like and subscribe. If you didn't like this episode, like and subscribe anyways, because you might find something you do like. But thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We've been professionally unprofessional. Professional.